Praise the Lord. Where are you? I said, Praise the Lord. We we'll rise up and pray as we begin our Bible study tonight. We we'll close our eyes as we pray. A great God in heaven, we bless your name because of the privilege of coming to learn at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray you grant us the help, the enlightenment of the Spirit of God so that it will guide us into the truth tonight in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, our hearts will receive your word. I will be doers of the word and not hearers only in Jesus' name. That Lord, as we listen to your word, as we take decisions based on your word, our decisions will help us, will help our neighbors, will help our families, will help the old church and the people who are connected with us in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray, we'll understand what you are teaching us. And we're not going to throw this in over the shoulder to any other person. We'll apply the word personally in every one of our lives. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. You can sit down. We come back to Matthew chapter 7. We're looking at the words of Jesus Christ. Very instructive words, important words, indispensable words in the time that Christ lived and in the time in which we live today. The Lord is giving us warning. And many people don't like warning. But in the world in which we live, in the world of light and darkness, in the world of good and evil, in the world of right and wrong, in the world of the broad way and the narrow way, we need warning. And the Lord Jesus Christ knew that. And because of that, he has shown us, he has said, this is the right way walking in it, and this is the evil way shun it. Abandon it, reject it, avoid it at all costs. You know, if in the world in which we live, if there is so much evil, and there is no distinction in our mind, no differentiation in our mind as to what is good and to what is evil, we'll not know how to avoid what is evil. I will not know how to have, how to embrace, how to hold on to that which is good. That's why we have this passage we are looking at today. By the way, if we were to just be picking scriptures, topical study, which many people do, if we are not going chapter after chapter and verse after verse, some of us will never hear anything like this in any of the churches. Because, you see, many people don't like what they call negative message. But you see, the negative and the positive, I told you before, they're both necessary. That's why we're looking at the words of Jesus Christ tonight. Matthew chapter 7, I'm starting from verse 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly, they are ravening wolves. That's the warning the Lord has given to you, to me, to the church in every generation. But the point is this. How would you take heed? How would you beware? How would you avoid being destroyed or devoured by ravening wolves if you are not able to discern? If you are not able to recognize the wolves when they come, especially when they come in sheep's clothing. You will not be able to differentiate, identify which one is right and which one is wrong. Listen to this. If, for example, you have two bottles containing liquid on the table and there is no label on them. One contains poison and one contains good liquid. But there is no label or there is wrong labeling. You put the right label on the poison, on the, on the bottle containing the poison, and then you put the wrong label on the bottle that has the good stuff inside. You're going to look at the label, and the label can mislead you, and then you can lose your life just like that. The inability to recognize which bottle is for you, and which bottle will kill, destroy, and take away your life, that inability to distinguish and differentiate. 
will take your life away. That's the reason why as we come to a study like this, Jesus Christ said, beware of false prophets. Then he must tell us how to recognize those false prophets. Imagine that you have an awakened sinner, a convicted sinner, and he says, what shall I do to get to the kingdom of God? And he comes to the gate. And here we have the broad gauge. Here we have the small gate, the little gate, the straight gate, the narrow gauge. And he wants to know, I want to enter into life. I want to get into heaven. Which gate should I go through? Imagine somebody coming right there and saying, you need help? Oh yes, I need help. What help are you looking for? I want to see which gate to take. Suppose this is the real false prophet. And it's going to point out the broad gate, the wide gate, and the awakened sinner, the convicted sinner, knows next to nothing, knows nothing about the right gate. And let's say the false prophet is talking smooth and nice, comforting and reassuring, and is well dressed, and he looks like a good man on the outside, on the surface. And he says, My friend, you want to get to life eternal. God is a kind, loving God, merciful God. I see you have the body of sin, and I see that this load of condemnation and guilt is almost crushing you. All right, to get rid of your guilt and condemnation, here is the way. And he points to the broad way. And that fellow, not knowing any difference from this way and that way, he takes the broad gate, the wide gate, and leads to destruction. He will perish. Let's say, for example, a true prophet is there. A good prophet is there. A faithful prophet is there. A knowledgeable prophet is there. And that false prophet is talking nice and talking with tenderness and talking with mercy and talking with comfort and talking with reassurance. But the good prophet, the good preacher, the one that knows the truth, the one that knows the way, he comes. But he talks harsh and he talks rough and he bullies on the fellow. And it says this, the narrow way is the way. If you want to be saved, not right now, take that way. It's harsh. The sinner will not understand. The sinner will feel the gentle one, the tender one, the loving one, the one in sheep's clothing. That's the right one. This one that knows the truth, that is harsh and tough and hard, almost cruel. And he's saying, that's the way. Take it right now. He's not going to listen to the true prophet. You see, that's uh, the problem of some of us. The true prophets are harsh. The faithful prophets are cruel. The faithful prophets, they are not gentle, they are not tender, they are not comforting. Yes, they know the truth. They do not present the truth in love. And the people that have the error, they are the people that are so gentle and so nice and deadly. That means then, we as children of God, and those of us who are soul winners, and evangelists, and preachers of the word of God, we know the way, point it out with gentleness, with comfort, and with love, in a believable way, so that the people who are listening to you, they say, that's right, that's the narrow way, and I'm going to take that way, the way he's presenting it, I appreciate that, I believe that, I accept that, I'm going to take that way. I want you to think about, uh, you know, your uh, doctor, your child is sick, and then did this a quack doctor knows next to nothing about about medicine about medical science and yet he poses to be a, a medical director or a doctor and then he clothes himself with the clothing of a doctor and you know he opens and the hospital is neat everything is fine as you are entering like this the signboard is inviting but the quack doctor and he kills, he destroys. He does not know the, uh, how to make prescription between this disease and that disease. But the hospital looks nice. And then when you come in there, he, invite, he welcomes you with a smile. And he says, welcome. And then he carries your little child that is sick. And then puts the hand on the head and says, my boy, what's your name? And then the child feels relaxed in the hand of that doctor. 
Although the doctor is false and quack and deadly and is going to destroy that child, the child will say, Mommy, take me to that doctor. I like that doctor. I like their hospital. I like the way they talk. Now, let's say they go to another hospital. This one is a good doctor. He's well trained. The only problem he has is his communication. The way he treats people. The way he talks to people. The way he shows people. The way he keeps people waiting on end for hours without attending to them. But he's a good doctor. He knows his work. And then he rushes in and sees little children there. I cry, shut up. Don't cry there. This is a good hospital. Nobody cries there. And then he's harsh and hard. Although he's a good doctor, people will prefer to go to the quack one that will kill them than come to the doctor that will help them and preserve their lives. We have a lesson to learn there. We have the truth. We have the word of God. And we have the message of life eternal presented with a gentle tone and with a loving heart and with a smile on your face and with a welcome that you really want to give something good to the people otherwise you'll be scaring them away from the narrow gate and listen to life and you'll be scaring them to go to those doctors and go to those uh, physicians and go to those preachers and go to those prophets that will destroy them and make them to perish I pray they will not perish in our hands and now Jesus Christ now has to tell us, has to show us how to recognize the faithful ones and the false ones, the true ones and those ones that are in error. That's why it comes to verse 16. In verse 16 it says, ye shall know them by their fruits. Ye shall know them. It says, you really need to find, you need to find out. And you need to know them by their fruits. Now, brothers and sisters, if we do not know the fruits of the people, you know you can make a mistake in looking at the tree because when you look at two trees far away, those trees, they look alike. With the leaves, even with the fruits, even with the height, if you are judging by the leaves you see on those trees, you'll make a great mistake. If you are judging by the height of those trees, you can make a great mistake. If you are judging by the location of those trees, you can make a great mistake. Get near. Examine the fruits. Look at the fruits. Because it is the fruit that will tell you whether the tree is good or not. Let me show you an example. We're looking at Second Kings chapter 4. In Second Kings chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 38. 2 Kings chapter 4, reading from verse 38, and Elisha came again to Gilgal, and there was a deer, that's like a farming, in the land, and the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, and he said unto his servant, set on the great pot, and seize a, and seek pottage for the sons of the prophets, and one went out into the field. To gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered thereof while God's is lapped full and came and shred them into the porch of pottage for they knew them not. You see that? He went to the field. He wanted to gather something for the sons of the prophets to eat. And they were already cooking the pottage. So he took all those vegetables and all those, uh, all those fruits because they knew them not. They couldn't recognize. They couldn't differentiate. And they couldn't tell, identify the right fruit and the poisonous fruit. See the consequence of that in verse 40. It says, so they poured out for the men to eat. And it came to pass as they were eating of the pottage that they cried out and said, O thou man of God, there is death in the pot. Man of God, there is death in the pot. Because they didn't know, they didn't recognize the fruit they were gathering. The same thing now you turn it on the, onto the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. If those prophets like trees 
bearing fruit, but you don't recognize the fruits, you don't know the fruits, and then you just go there. There is death in the pot, there is death in the church, spiritual death, calamity, evil, poisonous doctrine. False doctrine, destructive doctrine. There is death in the porch. There is death in that assembly. There is death in that fellowship. There is death in that program. But people don't know. That's the reason the Lord is telling us, check up the fruits. Check up what you do. And then check up the outcome, the result of what they produce. That's the fruit. And it's only when you check up, when you find out, then you'll be able to tell this is good or that is not good. When the Lord Jesus said, by their fruit you shall know them. What did he mean? What's the fruit? Number one, their creed. That's what they believe. Number two, their character. Number three, their converts. Those are the fruits. The fruit of any preacher, whether the true preacher or the false preacher, whether the one that is preaching the truth or the one that is emphasizing error, the fruit, the creed, the character, or the converts. Or you can say it's the doctrine, the doctrine they preach, their deeds, their lifestyle, or then their disciples. The people who go there, the people who follow them, the people who follow the teachings that they have. And then you look at the effect of those doctrines, of those deeds in those disciples or you can say uh, we're looking at their behavior we're looking at their beliefs and we're looking at the brethren the brethren that are there the ones they call brothers and sisters what's their life like as you look at their beliefs you check them with the bible you can tell this one is not the right word it's not the right faith it's not the right doctrine it's not the right creed it's not the right belief and as you look at their behavior, their character, and you look at their deeds, the things they do, you can tell this is not right. This is not of grace. This is not righteous. This cannot be of God. And then you look at the brethren who go there, at the people who bind themselves together, and they say, that's our church, that's our preacher, that is our prophet, that's the proclaimer of the word we believe. As we look at their lives, you can tell whether they are false prophets or not. That's the full fruit of their life, of their labor, of their message, of their ministry. The effect of what they say, and the effect of what they preach on their family, on the fellowship, and then on their followers will make you to know whether these are right or wrong. We're going to look at the, at the passage very closely. Matthew chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 15 once again all through to verse 18. Matthew chapter 7. And we're looking at it from verse 15. Beware of false prophets. There's a command. Beware. Take heed. Be watchful. Avoid. Don't just rush into a church or rush, rush into a fellowship. And don't just rush into hearing somebody. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are having in wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns, of figs, of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. There's no, there's no alternative. And don't let anybody deceive you with an excuse. Oh, the prophet is good. Only that the fruit is not good. Nothing like that. Every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. Every good person bringeth forth a good life. Every good father bringeth forth good children. Every good mother bringeth forth good daughters. Every good teacher bringeth forth good students. Every good preacher bringeth forth good believers, converts. Every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. And then it says in verse 17, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruits, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruits. 
And the message is divided to three parts. Number one, the inward corruption of false prophets. Inwardly. You shall know them by that inward, inward nature, inward character, inward characteristic. The inward corruption of false prophets. Number two, the searchable covetousness of false prophets is searchable, never satisfied. Just wanting to grab, wanting to get more and more. Greedy. The searchable covetousness of false prophets. Number three, the ignominious character of false prophet, ignoble, unrighteous, shameful, bad, without any nobility in it at all. The ignoble character of false prophets. We come to number one, the inward corruption of false prophets. We come to Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, all through to verse 17. And I want you to look at the word inward or inwardly internal. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. Look beyond their sheep's clothing. Look beyond their smooth appearance. Look beyond their outward expression. Look beyond their external characteristics. It says they come to you in sheep's clothing. But then it says inwardly, inwardly, they are ravening wolves. Ravening wolves. Do men, ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree. In what corruption? A corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Matthew chapter 23. At the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, the uh, prophets of the state, the preachers of the nation, and the religious uh, standard for Israel, they were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Those were the people that everybody knew that is the mouthpiece of God. How are they? Look at them. Matthew chapter 23, reading from verse 25. And look at the word again, inward. It's an internal issue. Want to you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter. But within, does it, does it, within. But within they are full of extortion and excess. And as we look at this, uh, don't let us just uh, be looking at the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It will do us a, a world of good if we look at ourselves. Our own inward lives. Our own inward thoughts. Our own inward motivation. Our own inward drive. You know, it's not just the outside. I think, you know, as we look at the sheep's clothing, as we look at us, we're all well dressed, most of us. Sheep's clothing. And we dress like Christians. But as we apply the words of the Lord Jesus Christ to those people out there, we must apply the word of God to the person sitting down right there or standing there inwardly. Your inward thoughts. The inward motivation, your inward reason, the inward drive, the things that drives you to do what you do, your life internally in your family, your life when nobody is watching you, your life what you do when you think nobody will ever detect, nobody will ever find out the inward life. And that was the problem with the Pharisees. They had a good exterior, a good outside life, a good acceptable, normal religious life. The only problem is within, they are full of extortion and excess. Verse 26. The blind Pharisee claims first that which is within the cup. You see the emphasis of the Lord, that which is within the cup, the mind, the heart, the desires, the passion, the drive, the motivation, the very foundation, and the very root hidden in the ground of the heart, the root of your behavior. It says within the cup and the platter. And that which is outside, and the outside of them, may be clean also. 
that Jesus says get cleansed and get purified from the inside and then it will come on the outside if you are clean on the inside you will be clean on the outside and the Lord is saying there is no point covering up because the judgment of Christ and the judgment of God is not going to be on the exterior, on the external. The judgment of God is going to look at what is inside. It's going to look at the very heart. And if the heart is corrupt and evil and, and dirty, then you're not going to make it. In verse 27, one to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward. Indeed appear out beautiful outward, but are within. Look at that again. Within, full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men. You see those false prophets? Uh, you know, sometimes you can, if you're straying to any of those meetings, and you look at the externals, and you look at the compound, and you look at the surrounding, and you look at the way the people present themselves, and now you need to understand that we who preach, whether true prophet or false prophet, uh, you need to have some training, training in public speaking. And uh, you know, most of the most of the preachers here and there everywhere we, we have some form of training. And because of the training we have, you cannot judge only by what we do outside. And we have to know when to say praise the Lord. And we need to know when to be able to motivate the congregation. We all learn that. And we need to know when to make the congregation relax and happy. And just, uh, you know, be willing to come all over again. And we need to know how to make our announcements. And how to, how to tailor our message. How to do everything. All that's public speaking. All that we learn. And every, anybody can learn that. Even the politicians, they have to learn that. And when those politicians come, if you only look at what they are saying on the outside, and you don't know their heart, their mind, their motive, their purpose, their drive, what is within them, they'll just take you on and you'll say, this is my man. It may not be your man, it may be corrupt inside. Only polished outside. And the same thing you'll find as you look at people, you look at preachers on the outside, polished on the outside wonderful on the outside approachable on the outside nice but the heart the mind the motive the character the behavior look at the inside don't, don't just say that's my church i'm going to join that church now don't join yet look at them on the inside verse 28 even so also outwardly ye appear righteous unto men but, he, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity may the Lord help us to be discerning in Jesus name in um, Psalm 5 verse 9 Psalm 5 verse 9 and the Lord is still telling us to go beyond the surface when people preach to go beyond the surface when people approach you. In, in chapter 5 of, of the Psalms, verse 9. For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. You know, instead of just saying it's very wicked, it says it's very wickedness. Terrible. Corrupt. Dirty. Sinful. Not saved unconverted still the natural evil adamic dirty heart and life on the inside but then look at it it says their throat is an open sepulcher they flatter with their tongue as for flattery that one they know that they flatter with their tongue and if you just look at the communication ability and you look at the presentation of what they have to say and you look at the flattery that is coming out of their mouth. You may be sucked in. You are sucked in into an evil system. Beware of false prophets. Which come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly the ravening wolves. And ye shall know them by their fruits. We're looking at Osea chapter 9. 
Hosea chapter 9, we're reading from verse 7. Hosea chapter 9, verse 7. The days of visitation are come. The days of recompense are come. Israel shall know it. The prophet is a fool. The spiritual man is mad. For the multitude of an iniquity and a great hatred. You see that? Great hatred within the heart. And yet prophesying, preaching, proclaiming. And there is iniquity within a multitude of thine iniquities. And yet, it's a prophet. And God said, don't listen to those prophets. And the, this language is strong. The prophet is a fool. The spiritual man is mad. Because of what's inside them. The iniquity. Look at verse 8. The watchman of Ephraim was with God. Was in the past tense with God. But the prophet is a snare of a fowler in all his ways and hatred in the house of his God. Hatred in the house of his God. Have you sometimes found somebody is well dressed and who can quote a lot of scriptures and who has a nice voice? And when he wants to, he can motivate people, excite people, make people happy, make people want to come back to his church. And yet, maybe when you see him after the service, and he says, from where are you? And then you mention the name of the church. And then, he has hatred. And then you say, sir, I listened to you just now in the church, and your message was great. I just told you I'm not a member of your church. I just came here today and I mentioned the name of my church and uh, you look like there's hatred in your heart against my church. It says, yes, I won't hide my feeling from you. All that, you know, holy, holy, holy thing, I hate it. How can you be a Christian and a preacher and you're going to heaven and you hate holiness? No, I, don't, I just don't like it. Perfection, Christian perfection, holiness, righteousness, this, that, this, that. I hate it. And then now you understand what we are talking about. They can talk nice. And they can talk as if they know the Bible. But there is hatred in the heart, in the house of God. And if you are like that too, yourself, you are coming to a good church like this. And you ought to be a good proclaimer of the good word of the Lord. But there's hatred in your heart. Hatred against the standard of the Bible. Hatred against the word of God. Hatred against sound doctrine. And you want to pull it down at all costs. You are one of those false prophets. Although you are sitting on a good bench in a good church. If there is hatred in your heart against the truth. Outwardly you appear all right. Inwardly there is corruption and hatred. Verse 9. They have deeply corrupted themselves. They have deeply corrupted themselves. As in the days of Gibeah. Therefore he will remember their iniquity. He will visit their sin. We're looking at Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2. Uh, we're looking at uh, this reference. Uh, the word of God is all over. Old Testament, New Testament. That men are always evaluating prophets or preachers by their outward projects, outward programs, outward performance, outward popularity, or maybe by public speaking. As long as we focus on the outward prosperity of false prophets and we do not consider the, them inwardly, what they are inwardly, we shall never be able to recognize or refute or refuse those false prophets. The man of God from Judah. You remember? He could discern when Jeroboam said, Take him. And his son uh, just dried up. And then he prayed for him. The hand came back. And he said, Come home with me. I cannot go home with you. The Lord has told me this and that. But then the false prophet, old prophet came. And said, are you the young man, the young prophet that came from Bethlehem, Judah? I said, yes, I am. Okay, come on, come home with me. 
And he talked so nice and so convincingly. And he said, an angel had spoken unto me. All these dreams they tell. All these visions and revelations they publicize. It's not always true. And you say, can they tell lies? Well, the old man, the old prophet told a lie. An angel appeared unto me. And then the young man rose up and followed him. When he came, when I was coming back, a lion met him and killed him. Beware. You see how they tell lies? And you see how they have the inward deadly corruption. And then you remember Jehoshaphat. He couldn't recognize the deception of Ahab. Or the deception of those prophets of Baal that say, Go on, and then the Lord will give you the victory. He almost lost his life. Uh, you remember, even the disciples of Jesus Christ couldn't recognize the false prophet among them, Judas Iscariot. He was, you know, the, he was a treasurer of the team of the group, and then he went in and went out. He was one leg in the fellowship and one leg making covenant with the Pharisees who wanted to kill Jesus Christ. And when he came, looking at his comp his composture and looking at his conduct, everything looked nice. He was like one of them, and yet he was false. He was a traitor. That's the reason you need to be very careful. And do you know that when the Antichrist will appear in this world, that is after the rapture, I would have left this place. I said I would have left. The church will be taken away. And then the Antichrist will come. And he'll talk so nice and flatter the people. He wants to bring peace. He's going to settle everything in the Middle East between Palestine and then Israel. Everything will be all right. He'll go to this side and go to, he'll be a great communicator, a masterful communicator. And he'll talk to the world powers. And the world powers will say, We have seen the man of peace, the one that will bring peace into the world. And then throw flattery. Everybody will rally around and make him their king. And then then just in the middle of the of the great tribulation, he'll turn around. It will be a terrible time. I pray you'll not be here in Jesus' name. But if the Antichrist, Antichrist, can so play his way and play his politics and get the hearts and the minds of the whole world, you will know then the false prophets can be very deadly and very dangerous. That's the reason why you need to take care very much. And you know, brothers and sisters, uh, our children, our children don't know any difference between right and wrong. Our youth, they don't know any difference between a good prophet and a false prophet. And we need to help our children. And you know, some, some, of, some of our parents, and they allow their children, if the children, if they say, mommy, I'm now, I'm now a graduate, graduate at 22 graduate at 25 you're still young and now I'm, I'm making up my mind I'm going to take a decision what decision are you taking I'm not going to come to this church and what's the problem and let me tell you every problem to tell you will be on the outside outward outward dressing Mama, mommy, I don't like your dress. I can't dress like that. I can't stay in the church because if I'm if I'm dressing like that, they're going to see me as the old as an old woman. All is external. And then they will say, Okay, what church do you want to go now? I want to go to this church. They point to the church. And when you look at the church, all you can see there music, whatever entertainment and those, those other things they do. Everything is outward and the child cannot detect, cannot discern the things that are inside there. And then you parents will say, well I cannot do anything if your child wanted to go and visit a quack doctor that will kill her, that will kill him. And you spent all your life, all your resources taking care of the child. And the child is sick. And you know the good doctor. You know the good hospital. But because the environment is not very, it's not, uh, you know, flamboyant. It's not, you know, high taste. But it's a good doctor inside that hospital. I say, my child, my daughter, my son, here is where to go. Let's go there. You're going to be treated. You'll be well. Mommy, I don't want to go there. Daddy, I don't want to go there. This is the hospital I want to go. And you know that that hospital has a record of 
terrible deaths. They just die and die and die. But the environment looks nice. Will you tell your child, okay, child, you are not 25, you are not 24. Any, any hospital you want to go, you want to go and die. Anywhere you want to go, I give you leave. But no, you'll put your feet down because of physical life, natural life. You say, no, you'll not go there. This is the place where I know this doctor. I know this hospital. I know how they handle people there. And I know the successes they have got there. That's what you'll say when it comes to spiritual matters. The soul of your child. When it comes to spiritual matter, the eternal destiny of your child. And they say, well, mommy, daddy, I don't want to go there anymore. Then you say, okay, bye. I have a question for you. Especially if you're a pastor. If you're a preacher, if you're, if you're a coordinator, if you're a group coordinator in the church and you're preaching and your child says he doesn't want to come to the church where you preach, he doesn't want to listen to you, he says you are a preacher in deeper life, but he doesn't want to attend deeper life, not even your location, he prefers another person outside. Let me turn it around again. Let's say you're a medical doctor. And your child is sick. And say, my boy, my, God, my daughter, hey, let me treat you. And the child says, no, daddy, I don't trust you. I don't want you to put your, your hand on. Don't make any prescription for me. You are dying. Yes, daddy, I will go to that other doctor. How would you feel? How would you feel? How will people in the community, how will they feel? They say, his wife doesn't come to his hospital when she's sick. And his children do not trust him when they are sick. They will not allow this doctor to treat them. How can I bring myself to this man's hospital? His relatives will not allow him to treat them. The same thing with church. If your child, if your wife, if your people, those who are living with you, they are not willing to be in the church with you. They prefer the church outside. And you do nothing about it. You are alright. And you feel at ease. And you know that in those places, they are not teaching them the truth. The whole truth that will take them to heaven. And then you just say, it doesn't matter. It matters a lot. It means you don't have conviction on what you believe. You don't have conviction on what you teach. You don't have conviction on the words of Jesus Christ that says, Beware of false prophets. And if you have conviction on that, you'll put pressure on your children by prayer, by fasting, by communication, by talking to them. My child, I know what's good for you. I know what's good for you. This is what is good for you. But if you just shrug your shoulders and say, well, it doesn't matter. I'm wondering what kind of believer, what kind of daddy, what kind of mommy, what kind of leader you are. In Second Peter chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 1. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily, privately shall bring in damnable heresies. That's our fear. That's our fear. The heresies they preach, they are damnable heresies. And because this scripture, this is the word of God, we're not making it up, they will preach damnable heresies. What was the meaning of that? Heresies that will damn their soul. Heresies that will destroy them. Heresies that will lead them into eternal perdition, destruction, and damnation. They bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways. I will not follow them. Although many may follow their pernicious ways, I will not follow I know many things. I know many people that do some things. I don't do that. Many people smoke. Do you smoke? Many people get drunk. Do you get drunk? You know, some of these uh, ladies, some of them will be almost naked on the street. Many of them do that. Do you do that? Many people, they take hard drugs. We know that because many people do it. Do you do it? No. That many people are doing something doesn't mean I must do it. That many people are going in a particular direction doesn't mean that you will go in that same direction. Be a man of your own mind and a, mind, a man of purpose and a man of conviction that you know this is the way. 
If you are just sheepishly following what people are doing, that's where everybody is going. Why don't you examine? Why don't you evaluate? And why don't you see that this is the way? And then you follow the right way. Because many shall follow their pernicious ways. It does not put any pressure on me or on you. That well, because multitudes are going that way. Haven't you chosen the way of life? Don't you want to get to heaven? Don't you see the way that leads to life eternal? Don't you single yourself out of the crowd and say, Others may, but... I cannot, I will not. Many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of and through covetousness shall they with vain, word, with vain words make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not and their damnations lumbereth not. They are going to perish but I will not perish of them. My family will not perish of them. My children will not perish of them. And then you must be very serious about making sure that your children know the way of truth. And they stay by the way of truth. And please don't let me hear the excuse from you again. You, you know, my child is uh, now about uh, 37 years of age. If your child is 37 years of age, your child joined a gang and is going to kill himself. Are you going to say, well, he is 37, let him die? No. My child is now 40. And because my child is 40, he has gone to join the occult. And over there they suck blood and they kill themselves. But you know he's 14 now if he wants to die. I give him the liberty now. That's the kind of father I am. I give liberty to my children because they're old enough now to die by themselves. You will not do that. If you will not do that in the physical, you will not do that in the spiritual. If you know that your child, your child is still your child. If my father was still alive, at my age I'll still be the child of my father. No matter how old you are, the, the parents, the father, the mother must still have some gentle control, convincing control, profitable control on their families and say, I'm going to heaven and I want you to get to heaven and going to false prophets and staying with those false prophets and staying in occultism will destroy your soul. And therefore, I'm pleading with you. You plead in any way you know. And mothers, even if you have to cry, daughter, son will know this is a serious matter. If you have to fast, and then you become lean, mommy, you are dying. You are getting lean. What's happening? You are the one killing me. I'm fasting because of you. Until you leave that place, I'm going to heaven. I want to find you in heaven. As long as you remain in false doctrine, and with those false prophets, I'll not be happy. If I fast until I die, I'll fast on your behalf. You must leave that place. When they see that we're that serious, we want them to get to heaven. We want them to quit all the false doctrine and leave all the association of the false prophets. Then they'll take us serious. They'll come out and you and your family, you will serve the Lord. And that, that's the reason why the Lord said beware and the warning the Lord has given us we're going to take that warning to heart and the Lord is going to bless you and bless your family in Jesus name I come to point number two the insatiable covetousness of false prophets insatiable covetousness of false prophets it tells us in Isaiah chapter 56 Isaiah chapter 56 I'm reading from verse 10 Isaiah 56 verse 10 is what men are blind. Think about that. Those are the false prophet the Lord warned us about. It's false. It is a what men are, are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs that cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. They, yeah, they are greedy dogs which cannot have enough. That's their covetousness. I don't want to follow a person like that. That's only interested in my money and is not interested in my soul. 
It's only interesting in, in the seed that I sow, a seed of faith. Plant a seed of faith every time. Money, money. I'm not interested in that. I don't want to be in a place where all they need is my money. All they need is my property. All they need is my substance. They, they don't care for my soul. I don't want to be in a place like that. You don't want to go and bury yourself in an assembly. In a place where all they want from you is money. They don't care how you get the money. They don't care if you get into judgment, condemnation, damnation with the government. And with the, with the almighty God on the day of judgment. Once you have the money and you bring the money. And that's why it says that greedy dogs which cannot, which cannot bark. And it says they, do, they cannot have enough. They are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way. Everyone for his gain from his quarter. Uh, we, there are people like that. And all they do now is just establish church, establish assembly, establish fellowship, establish ministry. All because of the covetousness. We're told in Micah chapter 3. Micah chapter 3, we're looking at verse 11. Micah chapter 3 and we're looking at verse 11 the heads thereof judge for reward the priests thereof teach for hire and the prophets thereof divine for money they do it for money you don't want to be in a place like that. That's the description of the covetousness of those false prophets. It tells us in Ezekiel chapter 22. Ezekiel chapter 22, reading from verse 23. Ezekiel 22, verse 23. In this passage, it's using the same language that the Lord Jesus Christ used. The language of wolves, ravening wolves, liars, destructive beasts. It says in Ezekiel chapter 22, reading from verse 23, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto her, Thou art the land that is not cleansed, nor ranged upon in the day of indignation. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion ravening the prey. The false prophets there, like a roaring lion, it says it is uh, destruct, it's destroying their prey. And then it goes on and it says over there in verse 25, they have devout souls. They have devout, not just money, souls. They have destroyed souls. And you know, sometimes uh, in the olden days, that is in the good old days, when, when the palace began, a Bible study was our backbone and our Bible study is still our backbone and we stand on the word of God and we preach the word of God without fear and without favor and if our people are coming from their house and they're coming to the Bible study and there is something going on on the side of the road and people are clapping and dancing and you know with the loudspeaker blaring our people will just you know keep on walking and keep on coming to the Bible study and no matter what was going on in town, no matter what was going on in the stage, anywhere, we'll still be able to have a Bible study. Because our people knew at that time that it is not just carrying Bible, it's not just preaching Bible, and it is not just, uh, you know, dancing and, and drumming and doing whatever it is. It's not just shouting, hallelujah, praise the Lord. It's not just healing and deliverance and miracle. It is the word that points out the narrow way that leads unto heaven. And I pray that those same good old days will come back in Jesus' name. Uh, but you know today there are some people uh, they've been in the church now for a few years a number of years they can miss the bible study because you know something is going on on that side something is going on in that other place they can miss some major programs because uh, somebody came to town and somebody is making a kind of noise there and somebody is making a kind of noise over there when you have the spirit of Christ, the mind of Christ, and the teaching of scripture, you're not going to open your ears to any of those things. And by the grace of God, we're coming back to that in Jesus' name. Beware of false prophets which come to you. In sheep's clothing, inwardly, they are ravening wolves. And here it says they're running, they're running lions. 
and they devour the souls. They destroy the souls. In verse 26, a priest have violated my law. Can you think about that? The people are supposed to be ministers, the priests, the preachers, the pastors, the evangelists. It says, they have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and the profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean. And have hid their eyes from my servants. And have profaned among them. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves raven in the prey to shed blood to destroy what? Souls. Souls. And we're concerned about your soul. That's why, we're, that's why we're making this, uh, you know, kind of a noise. You know, some people call it noise. You're going on the road. The vehicle. And the bridge in front of you has collapsed. You didn't know. And then you rammed into it. And then you went, you tumbled into the river. And by chance, luck, grace of God, you came out of that. But your vehicle is inside there. And then you came out on the road, and there are vehicles that are driving at top full speed. And then you have a red flag in your hand, and you're waving them, and you wave the red flag violently because you know you've been there, you almost died, you almost lost your life, and you have pity on these uh, motorists that are running at full speed, and they're running towards that same bridge that has collapsed. And your car, your vehicle is already under that river. And then you are waving them down, waving them down. And shouting at the top of your voice. I hope if there's any situation like that, you will not just take your, you know, red flag and just do like this lazily. As if you don't know what you're doing. And then you'll not be saying, hey, why don't you stop? There is danger in front of you. You understand? Please stop. If you don't stop, I was there. Who will believe you? But when you wave it violently and you shout, and if you have a microphone like a, I have a microphone, and then on the top of your voice, you shout them down. And then when they stop and they put on the brake, they say, what's the matter? Then you begin to tell them the story. They'll be grateful. You have so, we have somebody like you. You have to be grateful you have somebody like me. Because I'll shout on you till you quit that place. I shout on you till you leave that false doctrine. I shout on you till you come in here and you plant your feet solidly on the rock of ages and false doctrine will never move you again in Jesus' name. Because we don't want your soul to be destroyed. That's why we're making this. And it says they destroy those souls so that they will get dishonest gain. Those who don't care about where you spend eternity. All they want is so that they'll just get dishonest gain. You don't want to trust your soul into their hands. We're looking at Second Peter chapter 2 again verse 2 and verse 3. Second Peter chapter 2. Verses 2 and 3. In 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 2 And many shall follow their pernicious ways By reason of whom the way of truth Shall be evil spoken of And through covetousness Through covetousness They shall with vain words Make merchandise of you Whose judgment now Of a long time lingereth not And their damnations Lumbereth not We will not be of them We come to point number 3 Now the ignoble, shameful character of false prophets. The character, ignoble, shameful, reproachful character of false prophets. In Matthew chapter 7, we're looking at verse 16. Matthew chapter 7, verse 16. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns, or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. It's talking about the fruit of their character, the fruit of their lifestyle, 
the fruit of their conduct, the fruit of their behavior. In fact, we are told in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 12. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 12. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. You won't know that. You won't know that. Because you see, many of those assemblies and many of those places, they don't have an open door policy. All you see is what you see in the church building. All you see is what you see in the open. But you don't know what they do in secret. And the places they go in secret. And uh, the societies they belong to, that you will not know. It says over here, it's a shame. Something ignoble. Something shameful. Something terrible. Something dirty defiling. It's a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. We're told in Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah chapter 2. Still talking about these that handle the ministry. Handle the word of God. And yet they do not know the Lord. They do not know the word of the Lord. In Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 8. The priest said not. Where is the Lord? And they that handle the law knew me not. They that handle the law knew me not. You find somebody that comes and he speaks authoritatively. And he speaks almost convincingly. And yet he doesn't know the word of God. And he barely, he hardly reads the word of God. And he's not, he's not knowledgeable in the doctrines of the word of God. Of, no, he doesn't know the difference between salvation and sanctification. Between absolute surrender and consecration to the Lord. And between serving the Lord and serving the church. No difference. And the people that, the people that handle the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me. And the prophets prophesied by Baal. And then it says, and walked after the things that do not profit. And that's the reason why you don't want to sell their, your soul into anybody's hands. You want to stay where you know well the word of God is clear here. We know the life of our leaders, of our coordinators, group coordinators, of our state overseers, national overseers, and region overseers, and the local government pastors. We know them. We can get to them anytime. We know they are in and out. There's no secrecy there. The people you know, you know their lives, you know their messages, and you know it. Everything is based on this, on all trouble, on changing words of God. And you know that what we preach 20 years ago, 30 years ago, the same thing was still emphasizing today. This one you are sure of. You'll stay there. You'll not go and, you know, to something that just came up that you don't know anything about. Somebody is looking for how to make a quick money. It's, uh, you know, raising up something there. And you come and join us. Come and join. You don't want to do something like that. You value your soul. How precious your soul is. I pray you will not perish. I said you will not perish. In uh, Jeremiah chapter 23, I'm reading from verse 11. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 11. For both the prophet and the priest are profane. See how Jeremiah is talking. Because of the inspiration of the Lord. And because of what the Lord put in his mouth. That's why he spoke like that. And he said the prophets and the priest, they are profane. Yea, in my house have I found their wickedness says the Lord in his house in the temple in his sanctuary turning the church into almost a place of immorality you see in their offices in those churches as a place of immorality as we, as we see everything going on you say, what is this that's what the Lord is saying. He said, I discovered it. I saw it. And I saw it, he said, right there in my house. Wherefore, their way shall be unto them as slippery ways in the darkness. They shall be driven on and fall therein. For I will bring evil upon them. Even the year of their visitation, says the Lord. Verse 13, and I have seen folly, foolishness in the prophets of Samaria. They prophesied in Baal and caused my people Israel to err. 
That's why Jeremiah lifted up his voice. And that's why we're lifting up our voice here too. It says in verse 14, I have seen also in the prophets of, of Jerusalem an horrible sin. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen also the hands of evil doers that none does return from his wickedness. And that's the reason why as you love the Lord, you love the word of God, you love sound doctrine, you will stay by righteousness and you'll say no, anything evil will not get into your life in Jesus' name. Will not creep into your family in Jesus' name and then will not see or you know, get into our church in Jesus' name. We're looking at uh, Second Peter again. Second Peter, we're looking at chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 17. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 17. These are wells without water. Clouds that are carried with a tempest. To whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. And you see the final destiny of those false prophets. It says the darkness, mist of darkness reserved for them forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity. They are leal through the lust of the flesh. Through much wantonness. Those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. That is, they speak words of vanity. And they, they get, you know, the way they speak. They have a good command of the language. And they're able to project their personality very well. And they're able to, you know, tell you whatever they want to tell. And then it says, what they do is that the people who had escaped from corruption before, they lure them back into evil. Verse 19, while they promise them liberty. That's what they promise, deliverance, liberty, healing, and uh, prosperity. Well, that's what people want to hear. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. And you wouldn't know that. The servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought into bondage. I will not get to any other bondage again. The Lord has set us free, we're going to remain free. And you remain free in Jesus' name. Galatians chapter 5. In Galatians chapter 5, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. That's enough. Freedom from sin, freedom from sickness, freedom from satanic attack. All the promises of God are ours and we enjoy the freedom and the liberty. We just finished our retreat, our Easter retreat last Monday. And great was the manifestation of the power of God. And the Lord satisfies us with the teaching of the word and with the confirmation of the teaching of the word. He has set you free. I said he has set you free. Don't go back into bondage again. He has cleansed your life. He has purged your life. He has purified your life. You have opened your mouth unto the Lord and you have said, I have chosen the way of truth. I will abide by the truth. And you have said with Joshua, as for me and my house, we tell me out loud. Well, serve the Lord. After you've opened your mouth to the Lord and the Lord has blessed you and abundant blessings are still waiting for you, why will you then go and put your neck in the yoke of bondage again? God forbid. Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. But you know something, brothers and sisters? If you have been, let's say you have been taking some good food, real good diet, and all of a sudden somebody came to introduce uh, uh, the chocolates and the other things to you that uh, will be destroying your health, and you have a lot of them in the fridge, and then you come on here and uh, we have somebody to talk to you about how dangerous those other things are. We call them junks. That they're not going to feed you very well. They'll destroy your health. You know, you'll break down. You're not, you're not feeding on balanced diet. If you then say, as you are here, oh, praise the Lord for everything I hear today. I now make a commitment. I'm not going to eat all those things anymore. But remember now, they're still in the fridge. 
as long as they are there. You may keep away from them for one day or two days, even one week or two weeks. One day, you'll say, let me even taste out this. You'll go back to that thing again. What do you do? Clear them from your fridge. Throw them away. You know, if uh, somebody just became born again, there are uh, has a lot of alcohol in the fridge. And it says, praise the Lord, I'm born again. I'm not going to go back to into any of those things anymore. If he leaves them there in the fridge, one day he'll open that fridge and nothing will invite him. He'll take those things again. He's going to become drunk again. Or if somebody has, uh, you know, uh, you had this strange woman in the house and now you've given your life to the Lord. And then you say, over here, Oh Lord, I give you my life. I'm not going to get to that strange woman anymore. If that strange woman is still living inside that house. One day, you'll say, how are you there? You'll get back into your morning check, drive her out. What am I telling you? All those books and all those materials that are there. That now they are taking your attention. They are taking your time. And then the good spiritual meal diet you have in the word of God, you are abandoning that and kicking that aside. And then you are feeding on those erroneous things. And every day now, is I just like the way they present what they present. If they are still there, you go back to them. And then you'll be immersed in false error again, false doctrine again. And then you'll be captured by those false prophets again. And if you're still linking up with them, and you're interchanging emails with them, eventually they'll still write to you. And then they, they, say, they think that uh, you are one of their faithful people sending money to them. They'll still be writing to you. If you cut it off, you're going to cut it off tonight. I say by the grace of God, no more. nobody is going to bring you into this bondage of false doctrine again. You have listened to the word of Jesus Christ and you're standing on that word of Jesus Christ. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. Inwardly, they are ravening wolves. The Bible says you mark the people who bring in anything contrary to what you have learned and do what? avoid them. You are going to make up your mind. You are going to take a decision. You are going to consecrate your life afresh to the Lord. Oh Lord, I am for Jesus. Am I for Jesus? I am for Jesus. I'm for the word of God. I'm for sound doctrine. I'm going to stand by sound doctrine. I'm not going to have anything to do with the unfruitful works of darkness anymore. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer that the Lord will help us. And then when you get back home, all those things that are not right, all those things that will teach you error, that will plunge you into error again. You are going to say, Lord, I'm going to get rid of them, and you get rid of them. Open your mouth now, brothers and sisters. Let us pray to the Lord. You'll not be a friend of false prophets. You'll not be the defender and the protector of false prophets. You'll not be in the campaign team, publicity officer of a false prophet. You'll not be the distributor of the materials of false prophets. You'll not be the one that is writing letter of recommendation for false prophets. You'll not be the one that is sending your money, support to false prophets. Make up your mind. If you're a child of God, the words of Jesus will be very important to you. Take it to heart. Believe it. Accept it. Stand on it. Obey it. You have been saved, forgiven, born again, set free. You don't want anything to bring you back into the bondage of sin again. To the bondage of corruption. You're now in the narrow way that leads to heaven. You don't want anything to bring you to the broad way that leads to perdition, to destruction. You don't want to be a partner to those who destroy, devour souls. You don't want to be protective of those who are drawing people, enticing people to the way of hell. You don't want to be so soft-minded as to be sympathizing with the people who are drawing people away from the narrow path that leads to heaven and drawing them away to the broad way that leads to hell. You don't want me to be so sympathetic of quack doctors and say, so I just love him. I just like him. Even though I know that it's a deadly kind of institution he has raised up 
I'm still directing people there. I know they are dying, but I love the man. You don't want to do that. You don't want your side to support any false prophet destroying souls, making people think less of holiness, making people ridicule the way of righteousness. You don't want to support, be French, campaign for anybody like that. Beware. That's what Jesus said. You don't want to be friendly with those who are going on the way of perdition. Have they made up their minds? They're not going to change. And they use all their skills, all their talent, all their learning, all their training to disseminate error effectively and convincingly. You don't want to cheer those people, clapping for them, encouraging them, attending their meetings. You want to stay on this rock. Plant your feet on the rock, immovable, living a life that will not compromise the truth, uphold the truth, preach the truth, live by the truth, demonstrate that truth in everything that you do. Don't let us be like the false prophets ourselves. Doing everything correctly on the outside. But inwardly having corruption. Inwardly having hatred. Inwardly having all those shameful immoral practices. Doing things that should not see the light of day. You ought to be clean within and without. Pure within and without. Righteous holy, within and without, in the secret and in the public. Are you concerned about your wife? She goes to all those places, you know, where they're deceiving her. Maybe she comes to a city church on Sunday. Maybe she comes on Monday. But during the week, she goes to all those places, they deceive them. Oh, and you say she is a, you know, she is a woman of her own mind. You don't care if she dies. You don't care if she perishes. You don't care if the mother of your children embraces false doctrine and leads all the children into that same false doctrine, making them loyal, depend, dependent upon false uh, prophets. You don't care about that. You're not concerned. You're not concerned about which uh, prophets your husband goes to see. What meetings she goes to attend. You don't care about your children. I don't want any trouble. The children of our days. Whatever they want to do, they will do. I've spoken to them. Children, beware. There are false prophets out there. I can't do more than that. If they go to the false prophets and they lose their souls, that, 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 that's their business. Oh, it's your business too. Watch over them. Warn them. Put some pressure on them. Don't be so careless. You put all your resources bringing up those children, training them in the way of the Lord. Don't you care that 20 years, 25 years of Christian training will go down the drain? If they leave you, leave the church, you know, and then go to, they go to those places where their souls will be lost. Don't you care that all your efforts of more than 20, 30 years Will be a waste. Don't you care? Prevail on them. Compel them. Yes, lovingly, but effectively too. Bring them back. Don't just look on the outside, thin outward things. Inwardly. Inwardly. They are evening wolves. Their goal is to destroy souls. 
and lead them to hell. Churches are multiplying. Righteousness is not multiplying, not increasing in the nation. Ministries, assemblies, preaching, crusades, multiplying. What can this nation show for that? Where's the righteousness? It's all false doctrine. Beware of false prophets. They're zealous. They're aggressive. They use all the skill they have effectively. Jesus said, the evening wolves. Make up your mind. Open your ears to the Bible. Open your eyes and read your Bible. Don't allow anything, anyone to sway you. Don't love anybody to the point you forget to guard, you forget to guard and protect your soul. Don't be fearful either. Don't be timid. If they are bold in proclaiming error, you must be bold in proclaiming the truth. If anybody ought to be silenced, there's a false prophet that should be silenced. Not those who know the truth who are the truth. Open your mouth and declare the truth of the word of God. Beware. Avoid them. Destroy any material or false doctrine that will lead you astray. Feed on the solid spiritual balanced food of the spirit the bread of life the word of God avoid error at all costs be watchful be prayerful protect what you have stand for the truth hold on to the truth 